Now, yeah. I always like to ask my colleagues, you know, uh, do you believe there's life on other planets? And if they answer either way, uh, affirmative or negative, I always just say you shouldn't be talking about belief at all. Like you should be talking about like, what evidence do we have? We have no evidence for life on other planets. We have no evidence for simulation, but that doesn't mean- Well, do, we do have a lot of evidence for planets though. We have evidence for planets, but yeah. Well, actually let's go there. So I mean, that's a starting point. Yeah. So, well, there are some that say you don't even need planets, but let's say you have, you need a planet, right? So I've been to Antarctica twice. Uh, and I've spent a couple of months, probably in my life there. It's a big, flat, white, dead p place that's always trying to kill you. Not unlike Sweden. No, I'm just kidding. No, Sweden's a lovely place. I've been there too. Although I don't think I'll go back because of uh, several of my books have been critical of the Nobel Prize. Uh, Sweden but, but doesn't whatever. try to kill you. It tries to build your character. <laughs> Oh, you should work for the for the tourism board. <laughs> Although you don't live there, so. how do you know that I don't? <laughs> well, you'd be a great ambassador, Nick. So I've been there twice. You know how much life there is there. There's almost no life there, and it's one seventh of all the continents on Earth. And my argument's kind of just tongue in cheek. In other words, it shouldn't just be capacity. You know that that oh, there's a capacity for life. It should be you know, are there are are there you know ingredients for life that are mandatory, and how likely are those to originate ab initio? Um, not just that there's there's many plenty of places for it to exist. In fact, I have a counterexample. If if you say there's a lot of planets, I say well, there's there's at least eight in our solar system alone. We're actually looking for a planet number nine, as you know. Um, but there are these objects called meteorites. Now, these meteorites traverse the solar system, and they sometimes crash into places like uh, Argentina and, and other places. And some of them have crashed into places like Antarctica, and they've been claimed to have evidence for microbial uh, life form respiratory processes. This was discovered in 1996. Um, and it's never been refuted. And, and the question is, well, this, this brings up what's called panspermia, which, which sounds dirty, but it's not. But, but it's one of these things that argues that life could transport its way around the galaxy very easily, uh, just floating on meteorites. It, it doesn't solve the origin of life problem. But given that's true, and given that life on Earth emerged 4 billion years ago, how surprised should we be in a, in a Bayesian sense that we don't see life on Mars? And you hope we don't see life on Mars. Maybe maybe we can go there. You, you wrote an article that you hope we don't see alien life. Why is that? Why would you say something uh, so seemingly contradictory, at least to my fellow astronomers that are always looking for water and life? And yeah, I mean, more, more specifically, I think it would be bad if we found on Mars independently evolved life. So mm. life that wasn't the origin of life on Earth, nor was it like life from Earth that had come there. But if it had evolved independently, uh, I think that that would be bad news because because that would be evidence that life is common in the universe. I mean, if it's happened twice in our solar system, it's got to be all over the place. And since we haven't seen any advanced life, unless you believe in the UFO, like it looks empty there, right? Insofar as radio transmitting civil, so th then it's got to be this great filter somewhere between having primitive life on some planet and having advanced life like our current civilizations and let alone what we will become if things go well and then there are basically two possibilities that great filter could either be behind us in our evolutionary past and that would be fine then we would have made it through but the other possibility is that it's ahead of us and that we still have to confront this great filter and that would be very bad news because by definition the great filter would be some transition that almost nobody makes it through right so since since there are these two so conditional on finding independently evolved life there's got to be this great filter it could be behind us or before us we don't know which one but some of the probability would then be on it being ahead of us so it would be bad news for our own future prospect because there might then well be this great filter it would increase the chance that there is a great filter in our future but yeah i mean i mean i think there is life in the universe though it's not, I mean, uh, just probably very far away or what quite likely very far away i mean it's, it's at least if you think the universe is infinite and there are like infinitely many planets there then it would be a virtual certainty right that it would exist on unless it's there's not a just huge so, barrier to it and i think well even if that were a huge barrier like if there were a finite probability uh, and you have like an infinite number of rolls of the dice you would get any possible outcome, not just a few times, but in fact, infinitely many times. Sure, um, sure. Uh, but I think, you know, more important than that is, you know, it's great to talk about uh, the number of galaxies hosting planets hosting, you know, hosted around stars is is, uh, is truly astronomical. 
just in our observable universe and and now we're learning more about the ah, well that's a big difference yeah right so i, I don't think like what we care about is not like is there is there life inside of this galaxy behind me m51 the whirlpool galaxy you know that's never it's totally you know uh disconnected causally from any of our hopeful lifetimes right but well i mean you might care about both like so observable universes you care about because well a things that are in the observable universe you know maybe they will we will observe them or they, they could interact with us or influence us or like so that they have special sort of relevance to our prudential interests but what happens outside the observable universe could also be of interest one you might just care about it for its own sake but for, for the same reason you might care about people on the opposite side of the world you want things to go well for them even if you're never going to meet them but also from a theoretical point of view our beliefs about what is going on outside the observable universe might also indirectly influence what you should believe about other aspects of what's going on inside the observable universe, um, <laughs> since it's all part of the same physical existence. So there, there might be sort of theoretical implications as well.